Hello and welcome to possibly my favorite spot on the farm uh, underneath our old growth hackberry which is only really still alive because the previous occupants of this uh, fine land used it as their toxic waste dump site. It's a mostly unappreciated fact that the human species is entirely dependent upon the plant kingdom in order to continue existing. It's also a mostly unappreciated fact that the plant kingdom does not need human beings in any way to keep on doing what it's always been doing. Things like producing breathable oxygen, or food, or birds. The term weed, or weeds, means absolutely nothing, at least not in any sort of biological or scientific way. A weed is not a specific type of plant. It's not a tree, it's not an herb or a vegetable. It doesn't mean perennial or biennial or annual. It doesn't mean that it isn't medicine, isn't food, or isn't useful to humanity and or the environment in which it lives. It doesn't actually even mean that the plant is toxic or bad in any specific way. In reality, a weed is just a plant that exists somewhere where humans don't want it to. Weeds are just nature. Weeds are the ecosystem that would exist if humans stopped intervening. A weed is just a plant that we don't respect. Or even worse, it's a plant that we can't even identify, let alone understand. If we just take one step back from this and look at this from a distance, it becomes obvious that we pretty much view every single plant we ever see as a weed, or at least 99.99999% of them. By the transitive property, if all weeds must be destroyed, and weeds are just almost all of nature, then by our logic, all of nature must be destroyed. This is the linguistic distortion, this is the new speak uh, that has infected our minds as a species. It can't be bad to kill this thing I know nothing about, because the internet says so. This simple separation is not a small one. It's basically one of the Ten Commandments of Imperialism, and it's exactly what has led to 80% of the world's forests being destroyed, a number which continues to increase to this day. Manasseh Cutler, who's sort of like the granddaddy of Ohio Valley deforestation, wrote this about trees, or what we might call weeds. He described them as, quote, the enemy of progress. Now this might sound like a real dickish thing to say, because it is, but as an annual vegetable farmer, uh, it's really hard for me to throw stones because the main part of my job is uh, destroying weeds with the highest possible efficiency. All day long, I break my back, rip up my hands, and burn my skin in order to deforest my land over and over and over again. Just like Manasseh Cutler, nature is the only thing stopping me from doing imperialism profitably. Naturally, Cutler described the old growth forests of the Ohio Valley as the enemy of progress um, after marveling at their size and age. Because all the old growth forests where he came from were already long gone. He didn't even understand that trees could get this big. That wasn't even a possibility in his brain. His brain had been colonized. Therefore, he became an agent of colonization. Sort of like those bugs that get bacteria that inside of them that makes them commit suicide. Mingo white oak, for example, which survived centuries of logging in West Virginia because it was hard to get to, lived for almost 600 years. It was nearly 10 feet wide when it died in 1938, nearly 31 feet in circumference, which is wider than most of the coastal redwoods you'll find today in the Pacific Northwest. And that's not because white oaks are naturally wider than redwoods, but it's simply because we cut all those trees down too. In fact, neither of these species really has a defined width. Most trees don't. Um, we assume that oak trees only live a couple hundred years and only get a few feet wide because any that were bigger or older than that were cut down. Uh, this is, again, another Im a commandment of imperialism. It's like studying a culture after it's been subjected to genocide. You're going to come to a whole lot of shitty conclusions that only serve to justify the behavior um, that led to those shitty conclusions. Admittedly, the Mingo Oak was big, even for uh, other massive white oaks of the Allegheny Plateau. But for the most part, old growth forests anywhere near the Great Lakes are all but gone. 
and any tree older than 200 years seems like a marvel. This again is a perfect, perfect example of our colonized mindset because we now assume these trees to be old, quote unquote. Now I'm certainly anything but a scientist, uh, even though I play one on the internet, but it seems pretty obvious to me that when you chop uh, something to bits with an ax, it's gonna be smaller than its original form. Why exactly humans ignore uh, these ironies is probably in and of itself an irony that is probably only understood by koalas and they simply can't be bothered sharing such insight because they're sleeping all the time. A study in Britain found that 80 plus percent of children cannot identify a bumblebee and they cannot identify an oak leaf. But should that really surprise us when we define everything a bee needs to live as something that inherently doesn't belong, including oak-leaved things? So the next time you go weeding, whether it's in your lawn or your field or whatever, I challenge you to simply follow one rule, which is try to identify everything you plan on killing. Because if you do that, who knows? You might just end up viewing nature as a friend instead of an enemy. This has been a Rotenbiller Farms video. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to laugh.